Okay, this is an antenna program that I gave uh, a couple of years ago at a few of the clubs in the local area. Now with antennas we have lots of choices. Uh, first is, are we going to have a horizontal or vertical antenna? Uh, there are dipoles. There are phased arrays or driven arrays such as the ZL Special. There are other arrays such as parasitic arrays. That would be a uh, Yagi antenna. Uh, is the antenna going to be in-fed? Center fed uh, or off center fed? Is the antenna going to be for just one band or is it going to be a multi band antenna? So there's, there's tons of choices, uh, overwhelming number of choices when you start to think about uh, what kind of antenna are you going to have. And in addition to a lot of choices, there's a lot of opinions. Everyone has his favorite antenna. Uh, there's the Carolina window, a big following. There's the Step IR, the Long John, the Yagi. I'm not sure if it's as popular as it used to be, but there was an antenna called the High Tower. And of course, there's the off center fed dipole. Uh, many, many people have uh, a lot of success with the off center fed dipole. So that's just, uh, just gives, goes to show there's a lot of opinions. Um, but uh, in, in general, they all work. Now the question is, how well do they work? What best fits your QTH? Are you getting the best performance? Is it working well enough? What can you do to be louder? Uh, and what, what do I really need? What, what does not work? And how can I learn more about antennas? Now, there's a few things that we need to make sure we understand uh, to do with radio waves and current. Uh, RF current in a wire creates a radio wave. A radio wave creates current in a wire. That's like transmitting. You put RF current into a wire to create a radio wave. Uh, when you're receiving, a radio wave passes over the wire in... Uh, causes a current to flow in the wire. And current in a wire caused by a radio wave will radiate another radio wave. That's called re-radiation. Now I want to tell you how you can get information on antennas. Uh, there's a lot of books out there. You can talk to experienced amateurs and visit their stations. You can visit uh, a local field aid. You can experiment and build antennas. You can model antennas with uh, antenna modeling programs. Easy Neck is the is the one <clears throat> the one that I use. Uh, as a result, you can build your own antennas, and you can really learn a lot. It's uh, it's one of the things uh, in amateur radio that uh, you can you can still build your own, and uh, you can get great satisfaction out of that. All right, now let's start with books. Uh, one of the best sources is the ARRL Antenna Book. Uh, this happens to be the 19th edition that I'm using. Uh, antennas don't change a whole lot from edition to edition. Then uh, the AWR has a series of uh, books called the Antenna Compendium. Uh, I'm not sure how many volumes they have. <clears throat> but uh, I've got five or six of the uh, of the antenna compendium volumes. Uh, there's the radio radio handbook, <clears throat> even old radio handbooks such as this uh, have really good uh, antenna information. Uh, some antennas that were used a long time ago uh, probably shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, there are textbooks. This is the McGraw Hill Electrical and Electronic Engineering uh, uh, book. Um, lots of textbooks uh, that deal with uh, electronics and antennas. Uh, this is uh, uh, John Krause's book, uh, Antennas, a typical textbook that uh, uh, we use at Virginia Tech.
this is the Yagi Antenna Design book. Uh, this was written, I think it was by W2 uh, uh, PV. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole book is dedicated to uh, Yagi Antenna Design. Extremely interesting uh, uh, book. Uh, now, for those of us interested in 160 and 80 meters and even 40 meters, <clears throat> ON4UN has a book out called uh, Low Band DXing. Uh, there's been several editions. I think this is the fifth edition. Uh, it has uh, lots of antenna information, particularly for the, for the low bands. Uh, uh, there's a uh, DXing on the edge, the thrill of 160 meters, uh, a book by uh, uh, K1ZM. Uh, extremely interesting book, lots of antenna information. Uh, you can talk to experienced amateurs and visit their stations. Uh, frequently, uh, you'll find an open house. Um, in particular, every year, uh, W3LPL has an open house, and he takes people around and gives them a tour of his antenna farm. Uh, he has quite an amazing, <laughs> amazing setup with, uh, with antennas, really, really big antennas. Uh, you can visit a uh, field day. There's, there's always a field day going on uh, in, uh, in June of every year. Uh, all of the clubs go out and set up uh, portable antennas and portable stations in the field. Uh, the Williamsburg Area Amateur Radio Club, uh, shown here, uh, is, is always out uh, in force during, uh, uh, during the field day. Uh, <clears throat> last, uh, it's the last uh, weekend in June every year. And from then on, you can experiment and in, in build antennas. Uh, it uh, doesn't take a whole lot of uh, talent to, to build an antenna. You do need to know how to solder. That, that's, that's a big help. <clears throat> There's things called a buddy pole that, uh, that we set up for some um, QRP operation uh, uh, every so often. It doesn't take much to make a contact. Uh, we even put up uh, 135 foot high antennas uh, held up by weather balloons. Here's a picture from the uh, 70s. Uh, we used it in 160 contests and, and did quite well. Um, you can go to the beach. You can set up uh, a makeshift antenna. Uh, this was a, I think it was a Hustler Mobile antenna on a little stand. And uh, took a QRP radio, a couple of us, and had a lot of fun doesn't take a big location to have antennas. This was at a location I had where antennas were severely restricted. These are inverted V antennas. Um, uh, and almost invisible. Uh, this was uh, tuning my um, <clears throat> my uh, tower for a 160 contest. Uh, this, this was a, a great antenna right on the edge of the water. Uh, we did quite well in 1973 with that. Uh, there's a lot of equipment nowadays that's uh, a lot smaller than what I use. This is uh, MFJ259 antenna analyzer. Uh, a great, great little piece of equipment. And there's a lot of stuff like that out there. Uh, this, this shows the uh, frequency and um, resistance and the reactance to uh, an antenna that I was working on. And you can model antennas with EasyNEC uh, before you build them, or you, know, you can do it after you build them. Um, uh, EasyNEC is a uh, is a free uh, a free antenna program. Uh, it's a little bit limited in the free version, but uh, it's it's quite usable. Uh, uh, no, you can't model a big elaborate antenna with the free version, but you can do dipoles and yaggies and. Uh, inverted V's. The demo is free. Uh, <clears throat> it'll do a 12 element quad. Uh, the full version is uh, well worth it for for eighty nine dollars if you're going to do a lot of uh, a lot of antenna modeling. Now, there's no one perfect antenna for everything. That that's impossible. You have to decide what do you want to do, and you need the right antenna for the distance. You also need the right antenna at the right height, and you can be too high. 
frequently antennas are a compromise, and particularly for general amateur radio operations. Now, a little bit about antenna fundamentals. A balanced antenna is one where the currents are equal and opposite at the feed point. Now, this would be your typical center-fed antenna. Uh, unbalanced antenna is one where the currents are not equal. Now, this would be such as an off-center-fed antenna. And impedance, the impedance of an antenna is simply the ratio of the voltage to current, uh, usually at the feed point or uh, uh, any place on the antenna you can measure an impedance and, and the impedance is simply again the ratio of voltage to current at any at any point where you have a current and a voltage there is a corresponding impedance and <clears throat> that impedance is simply the ratio of voltage to current the feed point uh, the feed point impedance is the ratio of voltage to current at the feed point now there's some characteristics to consider for for all antennas. There's there's gain, which is essentially directivity. There's the polarization, or the whether the electric field is vertical or horizontal. There's the radiation angle, or radiation angles. There's the feed point impedance, very important to be able to get uh, your power into the antenna. And there is the radiation resistance. Now I'll try to briefly touch on uh, e each one of these characteristics. The gain uh, in dB versus transmitter power. A gain of 10 dB is equivalent to going from 100 watts to 1,000 watts output with your transmitter. Um, a gain of 3 dB is like going from 100 watts to 200 watts. An antenna gain works both transmitting and receiving. Um, increasing your transmitter power by 5 dB does not help you hear better, but increasing your antenna gain 5 dB does help you both be heard better and also to hear better. Now let's talk about the gain of a dipole. The gain of a dipole in free space is 2.1 dBi. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody's heard the gain of a dipole is 2.1 dB. Well, it's 2.1 dBi in free space. The gain of a dipole is off the sides and not off the ends. It's off the broad side. The gain in one direction is always, always at the expense of gain in another direction. Now let's note that the gain of a dipole on Earth, a real dipole, is not 2.1 dBi. The gain of a real dipole on Earth that you might actually put up yourself is 7.5 dBi. So let's remember, the gain of a real dipole is 7.5 dBi, not 2.1 dB. Now, I suggest comparing any antenna that you may consider to a half-wave dipole over real ground. Uh, if the antenna that you're considering does not have much more than 7.5 dBi gain, then you may as well use a dipole. A dipole is not a bad antenna when it's up in the air fairly high. And beware of any antenna gain that is given simply in dB. Uh, the dB must be referenced to something. Now, I think it's always a good idea to reference uh, antennas to uh, dBi. Uh, if, if you always go back and, and figure the gain of an antenna in dBi, then you're comparing apples to apples. Uh, I could build an antenna and, and, and advertise it to have 20 dB of gain. Well, that 20 dB of gain could be uh, in reference to a coat hanger that I'm tuning up with uh, my L-Network antenna tuner. 
and uh, you buy that 20 dB gain antenna and, and you can't get out of your own backyard with it, uh, the 20 dB means, actually means nothing. Uh, that coat hanger may have a minus 100 dBi gain, uh, but it's, uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> uh, I like to say, uh, you can compare it to a wet noodle. And you've got a lot of gain compared to uh, loading up a wet noodle. So remember, beware of any antenna gain that's simply given in dB. It needs to be given in dB in reference to something. Now we talk about polarization of, a, of an antenna or polarization of, of radio waves. A radio wave is an electromagnetic wave and it has an electric field and a magnetic field. And those two fields are always going to be uh, <clears throat> at right angles or perpendicular to each other. The polarization is the orientation of the electric field, the E field only. Uh, in general, uh, waves uh, leaving a vertical antenna will have a vertical electric field. And waves leaving a horizontal antenna will have a horizontal electric field. Now this by no means uh, means that a, a, a wave from a vertical antenna is going to remain uh, vertical and or that a um, radio wave from a horizontal antenna is going to continue to have horizontal polarization. The polarization is going to shift. Once the wave has traveled very far, uh, the polarization, the E field is going to start to move. Uh, once it's reflected from the ionosphere, uh, it's even worse. It, it can come down with uh, what we call elliptical polarization. Um, I guess it could come down with circular polarization, but uh, uh, m most likely it's going to be more random. Uh, circular polarization uh, implies uh, a uniformly rotating electric field. Uh, things are not really uniform uh, in nature. Um, that's why you can receive uh, with a horizontal, horizontal antenna you can receive signals quite well that have been radiated from a vertical antenna. Uh, once they have traveled through, uh, to the ionosphere and, and been refracted. Uh, at VHF <coughs> uh, when you're transmitting vertical to vertical uh, then it's, it's important because your vertical wave uh, at uh, VHF is uh, probably going to remain more or less vertical uh, for, uh, for line of sight communications. But once you throw the ionosphere into the equation, then uh, everything changes. Now we want to talk about ground effects uh, due to polarization. Vertically polarized waves behave very differently than horizontal waves when they interact with the ground. A vertical and horizontal dipole act the same in free space or far, far away from the ground. They have the same gain. But near the earth, they have very different gains due to ground reflections. You get about 5 dB of free gain with a horizontal antenna. Uh, when it's uh, over real ground. Uh, you do not get that 5 dB of free gain with a vertical antenna that's mounted near the ground. So there's, there's a big difference between vertical and horizontal polarization uh, when you bring the ground uh, into the calculation. Now I'm going to show you a plot of, a, of, a, of some antennas. The plot shows a vertical dipole and a horizontal dipole at 70 feet above ground. Um, <clears throat> the horizontal dipole is uh, uniformly 70 feet above the ground. The center of the vertical dipole is at 70 feet. So the dipole extends from over 100 feet high down to 37 feet. The gain of the horizontal dipole is 7.58 dBi. The gain of the vertical dipole, however, is 2.98 dBi. Okay, th this plot shows the uh, 
the, the pattern of the two antennas. The vertical antenna, as you might expect, uh, <laughs> uh, radiates equally in all directions. <clears throat> And the horizontal antenna radiates uh, mostly off the broadside. So we're, <clears throat> we're actually focusing some of the energy that we are putting into the antenna. Uh, in the case of the horizontal antenna, uh, we're taking it away from the ends and we're adding it to the broadside uh, directions. Now the radiation angle. <clears throat> the radiation angle is the angle that your transmitted wave makes with the Earth. <clears throat> 90 degrees being straight up and 0 degrees being uh, perfectly uh, parallel to the Earth. The lower the angle, in general, the greater the potential skip distance. I say potential skip distance because uh, even though you're striking the ionosphere at a very low angle, the ionosphere has to be strong enough to support the refraction of the uh, electromagnetic wave. For horizontal antenna, only the height above ground determines the radiation angle. Now the radiation angle has to do with uh, how far you're going to be able to get per hop. Now we're assuming here that we're doing communication via the ionosphere. Now as you look at the chart, uh, this shows along the, the um, left-hand side axis, <clears throat> shows the wave angle in degrees, and across the bottom it shows the single hop distance. Okay, I zoomed in a little bit so you can see it better. <clears throat> the radiation angle for example, about halfway up the chart, you see a radiation angle of 10 degrees. <clears throat> if you come over to where it says E region, that would be the height of the, uh, the, the E layer. And if you come over far enough and then come down, you can read the single hop E layer distance, which in this case, uh, where the era says E region, if you come over there and come straight down, you see that uh, you're looking at maybe 600 miles, 500, 600 miles for a uh, wave angle of 10 degrees. And of course, <clears throat> the actual single hop distance varies with the height of the region. So the, the region is moving up and down from about maybe 62 miles uh, to maybe 75 miles, something like that. Uh, if you come over further at 10 degrees, you will hit the F region. Now, the F region has a, uh, a little bit wider range. It's somewhere between 130 miles to maybe uh, 260 miles. So th there's, a, there's a big variation in your single hop F layer uh, communications. So 10 degrees comes over, hits the F layer, and it looks like uh, the minimum distance would be 1,500 miles. And if the F layer was really high, it looks like the maximum distance would be something like maybe 2,500 miles. Now, we've been talking about uh, the radiation angle as if it was precisely 10 degrees. Uh, in, in general... Uh, no antenna is going to have a pinpoint angle <laughs> uh, for its uh, uh, for its takeoff angle. Uh, so what you're going to find is that yeah, you can build an antenna whose maximum radiation is centered on 10 degrees, but there's also going to be radiation above and below 10 degrees. Uh, you, you you might have. Uh, your strongest signal at 10, but you're still going to have some signal going up at 5 degrees and some signal going up at 20 and 25 degrees. Uh, what this means is that your strongest signal is probably going to be at, uh, at 10 degrees, at 1,500 miles, uh, if, the ionis if the F layer is, is at its lower level. You will also have, you will also receive signal uh, 
further away and closer away than 1,500 miles. However, the, the, the signal strength may not be quite as strong because the antenna is not uh, designed to have maximum radiation at, uh, at, at a, any angle other than 10 degrees. Because uh, this is a hypothetical antenna we're talking about. Uh, and uh, when we start looking at antenna patterns, uh, you will see that uh, different antennas have different shapes of patterns. And uh, when you start trying to figure out, well, what is an antenna good for? You have to think about where is its maximum radiation? Uh, how much does that radiation fall off at, at other angles? Uh, how high is the ionosphere? Uh, are we talking about F-layer communication or are we trying to uh, use the E region for communication. So there, there's, a, there's a whole lot of factors here uh, to be considered when you want to know what antenna to use or <clears throat> which antenna to design or how, how to design your antenna. Now we know that the height of the ionosphere is, plays a big part in how far you're going to be able to, uh, to communicate. Uh, what your single hop distance is going to be. The height of the ionosphere varies with the time of day. It varies with the season, whether it's uh, fall, winter, or spring, or summer. It varies with the 11-year sun, sunspot cycle, uh, which is, uh, it varies with solar activity. Uh, and, and of course, any time in the sunspot cycle, you can have uh, a drastic change in solar activity. And there are still other unknown factors, uh, either unknown because we haven't learned them yet or unknown because uh, uh, I haven't learned them yet or unknown because we don't want to talk about them in this particular presentation. But basically, uh, time of day, season, sunspot cycle, and solar activity uh, are the major factors that determine the height of the ionosphere. Now I want to mention local skywave. Uh, local skywave communication would require high angle radiation, probably 160, 80, or 40 meters. And now the polarization of the Transmitting and receiving antennas do not need to be uh, matched. In other words, you don't have to have vertical polarization to communicate with another station with uh, vertical polarization. Uh, uh, it doesn't make any difference when you're working skywave. Uh, a low horizontal dipole works great for local skywave, and low means 30 to 60 feet on 80 meters. Now, for long-distance communications, better known as DX, we want low-angle radiation. Again, the polarization does not matter. Anytime you're bouncing your signal off of the ionosphere, uh, you do not have to worry about matching polarizations. In general, you want to use a horizontal antenna above 40 meters, a vertical antenna below 40 meters, on 40 meters, you want to use a horizontal antenna if you can get it over 35 or 40 feet. If you can't get a horizontal antenna uh, over 35 or 40 feet high, then you're probably going to go to a vertical on 40 meters.